Hello, everyone. Very much welcome to our live online discussion. This is in the framework of the online course, The Changing Global Order. I'm Madeleine Hosley, a professor of international relations here at Leiden University. I have tremendously enjoyed talking to many of you via electronic sources in this course and covering the various subjects that we had. And of course, this last week was particularly fascinating because some of you on a voluntary basis have actually worked out group proposals on the issue of United Nations Security Council reform. I'm extremely happy that we have this very active participation. Let me introduce everyone who will be participating in our online discussion today. Uh, we have uh, Lydia Swart, who is at the Center for UN Reform Education in New York, has had an extensive uh, career in terms of being affiliated with various different organizations uh, around the globe, very active and um, very active contributor to the activities um, of the Center. We have uh, Professor Hermann Schaffer who uh, has a very extensive uh, diplomatic career, has been the permanent uh, representative uh, of um, the Netherlands to the UN in New York, and obviously also knows very much the ins and outs um, of the topic that we discussed today. Professor Scharper, it has been announced in the course, has also joined us as a uh, professor on the Koymans uh, Lehrstuhl here at the Leiden University. We have uh, today three representatives with us um, from the groups that have formed. And I should say right away, apologies to those of you who have not been invited for the online discussion, but still had very, very nice proposals online. There has been considerable work um, in these proposals, also in individual contribution that we couldn't consider because it was individual. but. Uh, very interesting thoughts. So the persons we have uh, with us uh, today is Angela Betancourt. She will represent what is actually our third group uh, today. Very much welcome. We have uh, David Talbot, who represents actually the first group. And we have um, the group uh, by Krishant uh, Aruna Salam. So thank you all for being here, and one by one we will uh, introduce you. These were uh, the names uh, we gave, and for our participants, very briefly again, welcome Lydia Swart. Welcome. Thank you. It's nice Perfect. to be here. And Professor Hermann Schaper has also been introduced. Let me very briefly also show his picture. And one by one, and one by one, we will now um, introduce indeed our student uh, representatives of the respective groups. Thank you so much again for joining us. Now, what we will do is um, we will have a brief um, summary of the group proposal. We go uh, by group. And um, then after these um, presentations, we will have a quick reflection session where our experts get back to these uh, proposals. We actually have just decided to go one by one. So we will first have uh, remarks on the first proposal, then the second, and then the third. But um, we will have the proposals um, be uh, presented in the beginning uh, without then um, the comments given right away. Okay, there we go. So we will actually start out then with the group one, and group one is David Talbot is the representative. David, may I ask you to start introducing your, your group? Okay, uh, I'm presenting the uh, proposal of Stuart Cottrell, Trang Dang, Abdullah, Mohammed, Omar, and myself. We're an international group drawn from Europe, Asia, and Africa, and we'd characterize ourselves as uh, realists in terms of our international relations thinking in the broadest sense of uh, that. Uh, right, to introduce our proposal, we looked at three broad areas of Security Council reform, the overall membership of the council, 
the permanent membership of the council and voting reform. In terms of overall membership, we propose expanding to 25 members uh, and extending the term of office to five years. The issues that the Security Council deals with tend to be long-term issues, uh, strategic issues that need this longer view of things than the current uh, two-year uh, tenure offers. And to facilitate this, we'd propose uh, spreading the expansion over five years to feed things in. On the permanent members, uh, the permanent members we've currently got very much represent the balance of power across the world at the end of the Second World War. Though, that said, it is not an unreasonable uh, representation of the current balance of power. The permanent five are major e economies, they're major military powers, but particularly anomalous is there's no representation from either Africa or South America in the permanent members. So, to address this, we propose immediately expanding permanent membership to eight, with a potential in five to ten years of expanding by a further one or two. Uh, from South America, we would suggest uh, Brazil as the most significant economy of the region, though we do leave open the possibility for the uh, South American regional grouping to suggest alternatives if for some reason that's not acceptable. Africa, we don't see a single country that we could uh, say is representative of the continent and a major player. So we'd suggest giving uh, a seat to the African Union that is a credible voice for the continent. And for the third extra member, we'd initially suggest Germany, but we do recognize this would give a uh, somewhat overbalance to Western Europe on the permanent members, three from eight. So if this is unacceptable to the General Assembly or the uh, other permanent members, we would suggest South Korea. Uh, yes, Japan has a strong case for membership, but it's only recently it's taken the policy decision to allow its troops to be deployed overseas. We feel there's a moral obligation on the permanent members to be contributing to the decisions which do put the uh, troops on the ground enforcing these decisions into harm's way. Uh, on to uh, vote, oh, and one last point on the permanent membership. We suggest review of their membership every 50 years. We've seen that in the last 50 or 60 years, we've still got a good representation, but powers rise and fall. So maybe in 50, 100, 150 years, the UK will be an insignificant player in the world and uh, Mongolia will be a major world power. We can't tell at the moment. Uh, on to voting reform. Well, uh, the permanents don't want to give up their veto. Uh, a lot of the other countries don't like the veto, so we've looked for some middle ground on this. We've got a number of proposals. Still the same, one member, one vote, 60% uh, for a procedural uh, decision. But on the actual decisions of the Security Council, we've got some proposed changes. A simple majority decision, we would say, should be carried, assuming all the permanent members are in favour of that decision. Where the veto comes into play, we suggest if it's between 50 and 80% of members of the Security Council voting uh, for a measure, a single uh, permanent member can veto this. But if it's more than 80% of the Security Council voting for a measure, it takes two uh, vetoes to block the measure. It gets us away from the situations we've had in the past where, say, America was almost systematically blocking unfavorable uh, resolutions around the Palestine-Israel uh, thing against virtually the will of the entire of the rest of the Security Council. So in summary, uh, changing the membership, changing the voting procedures, it's going to be a tough sell with the Security Council. Uh, the General Assembly may not like it because it doesn't get rid of the veto. The permanents may not like it because it waters down the veto, but hopefully they can see there's some common ground here. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Uh, I think that was a clear uh, introduction to your proposal. Again, uh, let me remind everyone that the proposals uh, are actually available online, obviously, on our uh, course page um, on Coursera, the discussion uh, forum with the specific threads uh, that has these proposals. Thank you so much uh, for having uh, presented the proposal by what we call Group 1. The second group, um, is a group for which we have as a representative a uh, Krishant, uh, Krishant Arunasalam. Krishant, let me try to get you. Yeah, <laughs> Krishant. Uh, yes, thank you very much for having gotten aligned online, and please uh, do feel free to uh, present your proposal now. Thank you, Professor. Very excited to be here. So uh, my group uh, members are Ida, Christine. Uh, Leighton, Roshan, Nora, Isabel, and myself. So uh, similar to David's group, even my group is a truly international group. We have members from South America, uh, Europe, and Asia. So um, going directly into our proposal, so our proposal, we've considered the possibilities of um, the previous proposals and also the texts of uh, United Nations and to abide with them. So in proposing permanent members, uh, we are proposing five new permanent members with what we call as indirect veto power. So what indirect veto power means is that if a new permanent member wishes to block a decision and they want to exercise veto power, what they want to do is they need to get the consent of an existing permanent member. Only then they would be able to exercise this veto power. So anyway, we see a lot of pressure around veto power and then nations uh, do not like the permanent five having the veto power. And then even if there are new members coming into the club, it's we cannot uh, avoid giving them some sort of a veto power, which is why we came up with the idea of the indirect uh, veto power. So we are going to look at the economic power, contributions to world peace and stability, and the previous non-permanent membership with the United Nations Security Council and compliance to United Nations regulations and also the geographical location because we've understood in the past 50 years after the World War that uh, the global power resides there's, there's a lot of influence by the geographical location as well so and the non-permanent membership is we are going to add um, five new non-permanent memberships so which is going to total uh, to 15. So this 15 non-permanent members are going to be split into two groups, uh, six four-year permanent non-permanent memberships, I'm sorry, and nine uh, two-year non-permanent memberships. So the four-year non-permanent memberships are going to be, so these countries are going to be nominated by regional councils. So we've already seen right, uh, regional councils like the European Union, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the Arctic Council, the Eurasian uh, Economic Council. So these organizations have a lot of influence in the countries in their particular regions. So we thought, so this non-permanent membership for six countries, which is for four years, should be nominated by these regional organizations. And me countries, member states, which are already in influential positions in the regional uh, organizations, will not be able to be named as uh, non-permanent members. And the other nine two-year memberships will be uh, contested for in the United Nations General Assembly, like we usually do. So uh, coming to the five new permanent members. So we have five member states which we like to propose for permanent membership. So India, it has it is the second largest population in the world and one of the fastest growing economies it has served in the Security Council as a non-permanent member and has contributed significantly for the UN peacekeeping missions. And India's central position in the South Asian region, especially along with Pakistan, Afghanistan, is a key factor that we've considered in naming India as a permanent member. And then Japan. So it's one of the highest GDPs in the current world and it is it has been a previous uh, non-permanent member. And Japan's strategic location in the Pacific Ocean and along with China and Russia and Korea gives it a good good case to uh, propose it as a permanent member as well. 
And in the African continent, so uh, like David said, there is a lot of confusion as to which member state we could propose to be the permanent member. So after a lot of consideration, we decided we cornered on Nigeria. So Nigeria is Africa's most populous country, and also it's a growing economy. And we've seen a lot of conflicts around Nigeria. So we thought if Nigeria takes up the role as a permanent member, there can be a lot of influence in the African Union and the African continent as well. And next, Brazil, as well as for the uh, obvious reasons, and then Canada. So this is quite an interesting uh, choice because Canada is one of the largest contributors to the United Nations budget. And also it's an influential member of the Arctic Council. So Canada, and on top of that, is a very peaceful and stable state. So we thought more than a power struggle in the Security Council Permanent Members Club, a nation can Canada, a nation like Canada, can have its influence towards a very peaceful uh, Security Council Permanent Membership Circle. And so the reason we've considered a proposal like this kind is because we've cornered down that uh, a very drastic change or a sudden change is always very difficult to adapt to or the UN General Assembly cannot always vote into it. So that's why we've uh, thought about a step structure and also the indirect veto power. So ideas like this we think can be adopted by the General Assembly and also the uh, complete the population so that we we just start the reform at one point and then we move on into further points. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Krishant. Uh, very nice uh, how you summarized uh, this proposal. And obviously, we also got, again, uh, some of the ideas, I think, core ideas um, that your group has been working out. I'm still impressed also about the size of this group, um, that it was possible to come to one solution. Maybe that's promising in terms of the future. You know, take all the UN member states. You were the small UN there with the maximum number of uh, participants, and you managed to get a collective proposal. Thank you so much. We will get back to you uh, in a moment. OK, our next uh, group is represented by uh, Angela Betancourt. Angela, Angela, please feel free uh, to um, take the floor and to present uh, the proposal of your group. Very much welcome. Hello, I am very excited to be here. Our group uh, consisted of Heidi Wolf, Annabel Mauricio, and Leonardo. We took into a lot of things into consideration when putting our proposal, including a lot of the proposals that had previously been presented to the Council. Um, our idea is based on expanding the number of seats within the UNSC, and that includes creating 20, 24 new seats. Um, we wanted to give um, a lot of different countries the opportunity to be able to participate in this and one and several of the things that we uh, thought about while putting this presentation together was what would be the fairest way to reform the council so that all UN member states feel that they have an opportunity to represent themselves in the Security Council and how do we make sure that the developing nation and the emerging nations have um, eligibility criteria as well. Um, so like I said, we believe that there should be 24 seats. Um, this does go a little bit above the P5's willingness to add more than it's but is a global, but there is a global consensus based on information um, that we've that we've learned so far in this course. Um, three, these three spots can be filled with the top three emerging powers based on the ranking three indicators. So in this case, the, th the top three spots will go to Germany, Italy, and India. The reason behind this is that P5 members are reluctant to adding per, um, permanent new seats, so these three seats will actually be semi-permanent positions. Um, in order to be fair and more representative um, of the UN Security Council, we believe that this would be a good approach. And then every two years, or perhaps every four years, the three indicators can be evaluated while also taking into account things like the troops given and other participations. With the semi-permanent positions, 
um, there will be veto power. And I know we know again that the P5 is a little bit reluctant to have um, veto power from the other groups, but since this is a semi-permanent position, we believe that it would be fair for these three semi-permanent semi seats to have the veto power. Um, the remaining six non-permanent spots for the um, non-permanent spots can have four-year non-consecutive non with no veto power. Um, we propose then um, also filling the non-permanent seats with um, countries based on the rankings, you, um, the top rankings, which would include Spain, Mexico, Brazil, Poland, Turkey, Netherlands, Canada, and Austria. And also, we would fill the remaining um, uh, non-permanent seats um, with um, based on U UN peacekeeping mission contributions as well as troops given towards these missions. Um, the top eight countries that are doing that currently are Pakistan, Nigeria, South Africa, um, Argentina, and there's actually room for four more countries to fill those spots. Um, again, we don't think that the P, you know, the P5 is not very um, willing to, to, to have new additional permanent members with veto rights. However, we do feel that this proposal of adding three um, semi-permanent seats is middle ground. And then, of course, filling the additional non-permanent seats based on the top eight rankings of um, size of country, of economic and emerging influence around the globe, as well as filling the additional um, non-permanent seats with countries based on their peacekeeping missions. We also believe that there should be continued um, uh, non-formal reform within the United um, United Nations Security Council because diplomatic activities that enhance global security governance should continue as should gradual change for a more transparent um, Security Council. Um, in, in terms of voting, we were interested in Article 109 um, that really caught our attention because it's actually never really been put into practice and it is a good way to perhaps introduce this reform. Um, as we know, Article 9 states that 15 um, UNC members and two-thirds of the um, UNGA membership can convene a conference of UN member states um, to, to, um, cons for considerations of this new reform. So adding um, semi-permanent seats and expanding the non-permanent seats is the essence of our proposal. Thank you. Great. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Angela, for this nice uh, summary of uh, your group's proposal. This uh, was, again, a, um, a proposal with a lot of novel elements and a lot of uh, creative thinking. So thank you very much uh, for having presented this. Also very glad to see that everything worked uh, in technical terms, uh, that you were able um, to present uh, this proposal for us. Thank you very much. Now, we have had a summary of uh, three of the proposals. Again, my apologies that we couldn't take uh, all proposals into account. Let me also very briefly mentioned that we had ENCU giving a written feedback uh, on some of these issues. We will make sure that her contribution will also be uh, posted. A lot of work also went into that contribution. Thank you so much, ENCU. What we will do now is we will have our um, experts comment on each uh, proposal. And obviously, we will start out with the first proposal um, towards the end of the session, of course, uh, at each one of the group presenters gets the chance to uh, say a few um, uh, words. But first, let's now go one by one. So we will take uh, the proposal by the first group presented by David. And can I please ask Professor Schaper? to start out with commenting briefly on that proposal. Afterwards, we will get the comment uh, by uh, Lydia Swart. 
Well, let me first of all compliment uh, the authors of all the three proposals on their work, which, of course, we've been uh, in the UN discussing UN reform and in particular Security Council reform and expansion for nearly 20 years without any real process, uh, sorry, progress. And we need some new ideas and, and innovative ideas. It perhaps at first glance would seem a bit too radical, but it's the only way to see how far we can get by having this kind of proposal. Can I make just um, make some general remarks on all three of the proposals so that, that I don't have to repeat them all the time? But one is I noted that you didn't go into the working method, which was mentioned in the paper you got, but I think that's quite understandable because it's rather technical and you have to know exactly what procedures are in, in, in New York. I only want to mention it because it is part of the overall debate, and sometimes it can be an important element, but I quite understand you didn't include it. Um, the second thing which struck me is that uh, quite a lot of emphasis on regional groups, and, and of course we have the regional groups in the UN, but then members of the Security Council kind of representing regional groups. That is a very difficult issue, uh, particularly the African Union uh, thinking along those lines. Many others, including my own country, don't think that is the right approach that we will have regional representation. We are all part of a world community and we and the whole purpose of the Security Council is not to focus on or defend specific national regional interests, but to work together in solving problems which affect all of us. Uh, of course we have elections through the regional group, but that's different from being a representative of a regional group. And, and and that you will therefore only basically have to find the legitimacy in the group itself. Um, the third point I want to make is that there are, of course, criteria mentioned in Article 23 of the Charter on what basis should countries be a member of the Security Council, their contribution to peace and security, to other purposes of the UN, and then there should also be equitable regional representation. Um, but nobody, none of the three papers specifically refer to Article 23, which I, I would think is, is the basis for any further expansion. And in that line of thinking, if you talk about contribution to other purposes of the UN, apart from peace and security. I would include human rights. The, the, the role of a country in the area of human rights is as an important criterion for membership of such a body of the, of the Security Council. Um, well, then perhaps going into the, the, the ideas proposed in the first paper, um, like I said, I mean, there are quite a couple which I, which I liked, uh, not perhaps because they need to be uh, realistic to expect that they will be accepted, but it will help the debate if we start to broaden the, the different options we have to look at. Um, what is, of course, uh, will we'll take into account the concern of some countries, including my own, that if too many member states in the Security Council with the veto power, the whole system will be blocked. That's taken into account here by enlarging the Council only with three new permanent members. We can talk a lot, of course, about who, who Precisely, would then be the one who would become a member of the Security Council. Um, I was a bit surprised that India was not included. I would think that that's a country which perhaps has, has the strongest cards, uh, the best reason to be a member of the Security Council. Um, Japan was not mentioned, and that, in a way, I can understand. South Korea was uh, was mentioned, so one wonders why not Japan. But there is a lot of opposition, particularly from China, against uh, Japan from the member of the Security Council. So that is a not very realistic option. But I must add that South Korea, of course, is not at the same level as the other countries which are mentioned there. Um, but and there is the point that Europe perhaps will be overrepresented if Germany is only one of is one of the only three countries which will become a member. So we need a further debate there. Uh, but I like the notion of not enlarging the too many countries. Um, then on the cr yeah, criteria I mentioned, we have those in Article 33. Um, one thing I was wondering about, where, is it really the purpose to review each individual year the allocation of rotating seats? And it's, it will be difficult enough to get agreement on any kind of expansion, but uh, I think everybody would then want to have a period of consolidation and see how it works and not to go into a debate each year about the rotational, uh, uh, the countries who are there on a rotating basis. Um, then the, uh, what I do like is, is the notion of extending the length of appointment to five years in the sense that two years is 
the Security Council now is completely dominated by the five permanent members. So one of the reasons for that is that it takes a while to, to get a feel of how things are going in the Security Council, and then when you have it, you're nearly done already because you're only there for two years. So it is a good idea to extend the length, um, but perhaps the, variant, the option I like best is that you have a couple of countries who are there for two years and others who are there for four years. You can make, you can make a distinction in the elections between those countries, the smaller ones, you, which probably won't contribute that much to what's happening in, in the area of security, and larger countries, like which are mentioned also in the other paper later on. Um, I think I have to shut up uh, by now. But one, one last point then is that in this paper there's also the idea, first proposal, uh, an idea to that members of the Security Council which are party to a dispute on the consideration still abstain from voting. I think that won't fly. The whole, the whole idea with the veto was originally to prevent any conflict between the big powers. And therefore they have a veto in particular not, not by coincidence, but in particular relating to when they, they are a party to a conflict. So in that sense, um, I think you, you would perhaps open up a can of worms that, that uh, would eat away the basis of the whole notion of the Security Council being a place for, for a big power to cooperate. That's about it, I think, for the moment. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much um, for, for the, this comment. Um, I know that probably uh, David would be very tempted <laughs> to respond to a couple of issues, but we will first uh, indeed um, have the comments uh, by Lydia Swart on uh, this proposal and get back also to the comments on the other proposals and make sure, of course, that everyone gets a turn to um, respond to some of the issues uh, in the light of uh, the comments that have been given. So let me now pass on to Lydia Swart in New York. Well, thank you very much for this opportunity to comment on three proposals that have, in my opinion, very, very fascinating elements. Like uh, Professor Schaper, I would like to make a few general comments. Uh, and, and the first one is about permanent memberships. One would hope that new permanent members want to take on such an important role because of a sense of responsibility because they are willing and able to contribute, even pay more dues towards peacekeeping, for instance. So it should be done out of a sense of responsibility, but I think realism probably informs us that it's more a question of prestige. And another issue is, uh, uh, one ambassador made a very interesting quote, he said, uh, it is an IPI publication, he said, if you don't want to be on the agenda of the Security Council, make sure you have a seat at the table. And, and let's be fair, some members want a permanent seat so they can prevent action uh, in regards to their own country or their best friends. So um, these are some critical remarks. I am astounded uh, about all proposals that there is no consensus that the G4 deserve permanent seats. These G4 countries have been really feeling entitled to a permanent seat and it seems they have a great deal of support. And about proposal one, why, like Professor Schaper, why South Korea would be a better candidate than Japan or India is, is, is a little bit curious to me. Japan pays well over 10% of the dues to the UN, is active in peacekeeping, and India is a huge country uh, that uh, contributes a lot of peacekeeping troops, for which it gets reimbursed, by the way, but uh, still, those two countries uh, make enormous contributions to the UN. But then you go into what would be the criteria for getting a permanent seat. And the problem with that is that a criteria, some, a set of criteria may be applicable, applicable to some aspirant countries but not to the 
some other African countries, for instance. Uh, I think one of the proposals goes into that tricky issue. And if you have criteria, what if a country doesn't meet that criteria anymore after a period of 10 or 20 years? Will the membership be able to revisit their permanent membership in light of changing circumstances? Uh, specifically about proposal one, I think the voting report reform proposal is absolutely fascinating and deserves a lot of attention and I will highlight it on the Center for UN Reform because I think it is a fresh idea worth exploring. I can't hear you. Sorry, yes, here we are. <laughs> Thank you very much for your contribution. I think that was a uh, very nice piece of information. Uh, how nice that um, this can be made available even to a larger public uh, when there is such a nice thought coming out of a group. I think it gets time actually to see whether David would want to have a very brief response uh, to some of the comments raised and we should probably be very brief. It's more like a minute then we move to the second proposal. Okay, thanks for your comments. Uh everybody. Uh, yes, uh, I agree these proposals are overly simplistic, uh, probably to uh, surmise them. Uh, they're the results of a week's work and we don't have your guys' uh, detailed knowledge of how things actually work in the real politic of the uh, United Nations, so it's been fascinating to hear all that. Uh, very glad you liked our uh, voting reform proposals. As we said, this is very much the first ideas. We've been working on this for a week. Uh, no doubt they can be polished an awful lot, but we hope that that is something that gives a bit of common ground between those who hate the idea that anybody gets a veto and the current P5 who say, we've got our veto and we're keeping it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes, I think a lot of ideas and, uh, and actually given how difficult it can be to coordinate um, between people on different continents uh, and how little time there was to do this voluntary assignment, I think this is uh, really a very nice uh, product. Actually, all three, obviously, that were selected. Uh, thank you so much for all the efforts that went in. Now, let us get, get back uh, and give feedback on Proposal 2, which has been presented uh, by Chris Hunt in this online discussion. Professor Schaper, would you mind starting out? Well, again, like I said in the beginning, um, um, com my compliments, to, particularly if you only work for a week on this, uh, about the, uh, the new ideas and you suggested and the arguments you, you put forward to defend them. Uh, I, I, in particular, thought this idea of having an indirect veto power for a new uh, permanent member state, a very elegant way of financing the issue. In the sense, if, if I read it carefully, there are no new veto powers. It's still all depending on the P5, whether they would agree to the veto power being exercised by one of the new members, permanent members. But it gives the idea that the new permanent members are not completely second class because they have a kind of a way towards the veto by getting one of the P5 on their side. So it's a very diplomatic, a very clever way of kind of bringing together these different approaches. No new, no new veto powers, but not putting the new permanent members too much in, in the second class uh, position. Um, then there is the idea also creative to have uh, a distinction in, within the group of non-permanent member states um, of six countries staying on for four years and, and the other four only for two years. Um, and then the, um, I think that is a, a, perhaps a way towards one of the thoughts which have been circulating in, in New York, uh, but it also comes back in the other proposals, that some member countries could stay on longer in recognition of their kind of in-between position between the common membership of the, of the, of the UN and, and the P5, if you have a kind of intermediate group which would stay on longer as an elected non-permanent member of the Security Council. Different, different ideas. Uh, I also mentioned it earlier when I commented on, on the first proposal that you could perhaps make a distinction indeed between those who go into a four years membership and those into a two years membership looking at the contribution currently made. Um, 
Then there is this uh, idea that um, I, I already mentioned it, that, that six four-year memberships will be named by regional organizations. I, that, that I don't like. I think it should in the end always be the General Assembly as a whole who decides who will be in the member of, who will be a member of the Security Council. Um, let me see if I got, oh, I have lots of more remarks, but yeah, one thing is that, of course, the regional unions you mentioned, I don't, I'm not quite sure they cover all member states in, uh, particularly in Europe, you have, you have, of course, countries outside of the European Union who are, who are not part of any other of, uh, structure you mentioned here, but that, all that is, is easily remed uh, remedied, I think. Um, so that is, let me just quickly look. Uh, no, I think that's what I have for the moment. Yeah. Thank you very much uh, for this feedback. We pass on again to Lydia Swart for comments on this proposal. Well, a lot of the remarks I was going to make <clears throat> were made already by Professor Schaper, uh, but so I make just a few points. He considered having indirect veto power, an elegant solution. To me, however, it also reeks a little bit of paternalism. You still have the P5 that will make the final decision. And I'm wondering if you could also reverse this proposal, that P5 members will need to find a, a, another voice in the new permanent members before they can veto. Um, I don't know if that's clear. As to, um, again, the proposed permanent members in Nigeria, obviously there are other countries in the African Union in contention, such as South Africa and Egypt, and in fact that Security Council reform has been so difficult uh, to resolve is because the African Union the, has a common position but internal divisions prevents it from being flexible. Uh, I think it's an important point to make. Now and about Canada, I would like to say Canada for 20 years has argued that it doesn't believe in new permanent seats, that it only wants non-permanent seats added and maybe longer term seats. So. I think it would be very hard for Canada to suddenly become a permanent member candidate. Uh, also, like uh, Professor Schaper, I think the proposed regions are not going to be uh, easily agreed to, and it is worth noting that, for instance, Arab states and Islamic countries are, and small island states are all clamoring to be recognized as their, as their own group. So this is going to be very, very complex to, to, to make, uh, bring about. Thank you. Thank you uh, on these uh, comments on the second proposal. Yes, some of the feedback, of course, kind of applies to all the proposals, but very nice that we had also some very specific ones. Uh, Christian, maybe it would be a moment to very briefly uh, get back on this. Uh, thank you very much, Professor. Thank you very much for the valuable feedback. Of course, uh, we are just in the learning uh, phase, so we uh, it was just one week that we had and uh, quite a bit of reading we had to do. So um, so major assumption we had uh, when we wrote this proposal was the P5 is not going to uh, give up their uh, veto power. So we, the solution we were looking for is to for a proposal for a reform around this uh, assumption. So that was uh, one major uh, assumption we had before we uh, wrote the proposal. Um, yes, and the feedback is really valuable. I think we as a group are going to reflect back on this and uh, try to improve our proposal. Thank you very much. Thank you so much uh, for, for this feedback and again kind of representing uh, your group that indeed also put a lot of work uh, into this and again this very often happens next to regular jobs, <laughs> full days, so this is uh, quite an achievement. Thank you so much again <laughs> to all the participants. Now let us uh, have a, a quick uh, round of feedback on the third proposal that has been uh, presented by Angela. Let me pass on again to Professor Schaper. Thank you. Uh, well, there are three uh, 
three variants of an expansion of the Security Council in, in this proposal, A and B, and then later on when the text there is the third one. Let me say right from the beginning, I like B best. I mean, there, I think it goes rather in the direction of what we were thinking of in, 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 in Europe, well, I will say, and, we're, and the proposals we thought in the end could perhaps have the best chance of being accepted is this creating this middle group of, of seats where you could stay on longer and there the, the countries who would not be a new permanent member could find some solace in the fact that they still would have a special position. Um, but that could only be the outcome in the end, I think, when there is a general feeling that, that the only way to get a deal is to, to compromise, and then this is, I think, the kind of compromise we could think of. Um, I also, well, I, I, I used the word elegant also for the last proposal, I'll use it again for this one. I mean, I, I like the architecture of this uh, approach here, that uh, four, four times six, uh, each region having six uh, six and then 24 in total, which is the number we would prefer to. The lower the better from the Netherlands perspective, so 24 is better than 25. You need, of course, then uh, to change also the regional groups in in in, in, in UN, I suppose. Uh, we have there the problem that uh, the regional groups are based on the Cold War. We have Western Europe and other states, and we have Eastern Europe. And some of these Eastern European countries are member of the EU, so there is a kind of a um, well, some, some vision within the within UN terms of, of what we consider to be one group, which is the European Union, and, and we coordinate a lot in the UN and work together there. Um, I have some doubts on, although again it's surprising, and therefore perhaps one should think about it. There are some doubts about this notion of combining two years' term with a veto. Uh, the veto, of course, is, is seen as, as exclusively reserved for, for the P5, who are permanently on, on, the, on the council. And then you, you, you jump to the other side, so to speak, in this proposal and say, no, one, some of the, those countries who are there only for two years would get a veto. And then makes very important, very important who will be that country? Will it be a responsible country? Will it take the, the wider interests of, of the UN and the security and international community into account while it's only there for two years? So, um, so I, I need to think about that more. It is, it is a spectacularly new, <laughs> and that makes it attractive to think about it. I'm not sure. Well, let's see how we, I'm not sure whether, apart from whether it will be accepted. But it should, it should probably be a little bit more elaborated on, on what basis would those countries then be elected that they have a very special position of having a, a, a veto power. That's it. <clears throat> Thank you very much um, for the feedback on the third proposal. Uh, let us pass on again to Lydia Swart to give some comments on this proposal. Oh, well, first of all, I would like to say that among the three proposals, I don't have a singular preference, and maybe I was sounding too negative about proposal two. I think it is of high quality as well. Now, because I write about Security Council reform in neutral terms, it's difficult for me to show my hand, but I'm going to. Probably, I prefer longer term and renewable seats as for instance proposed in model B of proposal 3. The advantage of such a new category is that you can hold those members accountable. If they do a bad job you can vote them off when the time is up. up. Um, so th it's because of the accountability issue. At the same time I think Africa has a very strong case for getting a permanent seat, as do the Latin Americans. And this, if this cannot be sorted out, and that is my biggest fear, that countries uh, among the regions, especially in Africa, cannot resolve this issue, so the whole reform process uh, will remain stalled. Um, I think, like uh, Professor Schaper, that uh, veto right for short-term seats is uh, probably a risky undertaking, but I, I would have to think a little bit about it more. And I want to give time to, to, to the rest of the participants in, in this program to, to 
provide comments, so I'll leave it at that. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much uh, for this uh, feedback. Um, we again uh, invite uh, Angela to briefly uh, react to these comments. Um, at the end of this session, um, we will give each of you a chance for just about half a minute to a minute, um, provide some final reflections before we then uh, round off. But right now, let us give Angela the chance to react from her group's uh, perspective. Thank you so much for the very valuable and incredible um, feedback. Um, this has been such a wonderful exercise for us in our group. And yeah, we are definitely in the learning stages. And this has been so interesting. And we didn't have as much time as we wanted to put um, th uh, additional things together for this um, proposal, including um, wanting to incorporate how the G4 can fit into our ideas. Um, we actually titled this um, proposal a, a G4 mix um, because there were a lot of things that we did want to take into consideration for this and um, we are incredibly grateful for for this feedback and it's definitely given us um, a lot to think about and thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, yes, that's exactly what it's all about. A online learning experience and very valuable to these, discuss these ideas. I should also mention that uh, what I have not said yet to those of you watching uh, the broadcast is that this week also um, many of you are still working on weekly quizzes and on the final exam for this course. So everything comes together and I think uh, it's even more of an achievement. Some of you probably present may already have achieved all of this. So there was a lot indeed um, facing you and it is remarkable um, that you got these uh, very nice products uh, for us. Now let me very briefly uh, summarize some of the aspects before each of you very shortly again is going to be invited. Uh, we take uh, the persons again in the order of the presentations with David uh, going uh, first, um, uh, being followed then by Christian. But right now let me just say a few things. We've had uh, several lectures on the UN Security Council and um, the various proposals that had already been suggested for reform. We had to leave out several other ones <laughs> because so many have already been on the table. Um, it is, of course, we all are aware of that, an amazing hurdle, um, to put it that way, to get to some kind of uh, change of definitely the cancellation of the Security Council. Um, a lot of focus is more on the informal working um, level um, aspects that could be more realistic. Uh, what you, of course, see is the different questions on the table, one, the size of a potential future Security Council where we see some kind of convergence, it seems, something between 24 and 26 um, for most of the proposals. The veto issue that is extremely difficult to handle. Uh, the question if new uh, members came in, uh, if they had permanent or semi-permanent seats, would there be anything like a veto attached? What would need to happen with the veto in any case in the long term? Many, many questions uh, that are on the table. And then, of course, the very difficult uh, issue. Once we would have a new constellation, new permanent new permanent, non-permanent members, what actually are the criteria? Yes, there is a basis, but still there are a lot of possibilities in terms of what exactly one would look at. Uh, obviously, many criteria have been mentioned, things like uh, GDP, like uh, population size, uh, like the contributions uh, to peacekeeping uh, missions. There's a lot out there, but still very difficult to decide, given also the regional rivalries. So I think this discussion today has summarized some of these uh, issues. Uh, there have been very creative proposals also looking at what are the constraints and what could potentially come out of discussions. So given the various constraints, the institutional hurdles, I thought it was amazing to see these contributions. So let me at this point already thank everyone for these very, very valuable contributions. Now let me turn again as promised uh, first to David for a few final words. David, please take the floor. Okay, uh, yes, thanks very much for the opportunity uh, to do this. 
yeah, picking the exact countries to give those new permanent seats was probably what occupied us the most, uh, and probably uh, 10 countries were discussed to come up with our list. We tried to keep things down because, as I'm sure we've all experienced, the chances of getting a sensible decision out of any committee is inversely proportional to the size of that uh, committee. Uh, and just to finish, if you get time to feedback, great, if not, maybe on the forums. A question for the experts. Uh, resistance to change is part of human nature and it seems to be the part of the nature of states as well. How do you think, as the world gets more complicated and this resistance to change grows, we're ever going to get anything done about this? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That was a great way of putting a question, I think, in our final comments. Those of you who feel taking up uh, this very relevant question, uh, please indeed do so. Thank you so much, David, for your participation. Um, actually, Christian, please take the floor. Thank you, Professor. Um, this has been a very wonderful, great opportunity for all of us in my team to get together and present this uh, and receive valuable feedback. Um, and so, like I said, uh, our uh, whole proposal was built up on the assumption of the Permanent Five not willing to lose their veto power, so we managed to find a workaround uh, around that. And uh, the other reason of uh, structuring the non-permanent membership, we thought that could also add to the um, diversity or the inclusion of the Security Council. So our uh, main motive was to um, to find a geographically uh, inclusive as well as a trustworthy uh, Security Council for uh, a better future of the planet. Thank you. That was also a tremendously nice uh, remark at the end of uh, your, um, your statement. Thank you so much uh, for this. Uh, Angela. Final statement. Um, thank you again so much. Um, at the core of our proposal, we really wanted to find a way that everyone um, can have um, eligibility criteria to be a non-permanent member and give um, emerging powers the opportunity to have a semi-permanent role um, within permanent seats for, for the Security Council. And we really wanted to find a way that would be representative of including, including um, both emerging powerful countries as well as countries that um, have done a lot to contribute to peacekeeping missions and give them the opportunity to um, be able to participate and be, have eligibility for non-permanent seats. And our, um, we really wanted to give um, for permanent seats the opportunity for these emerging countries to have veto power, but in a semi-permanent position. So the feedback that we received um, was very, incredibly insightful, has given us a lot more to think about and has added so much more to this um, entire experience and our group is incredibly um, grateful and um, to be able to have been able to present. So thank you all so, so much. Thank you very much for your uh, final statement. Now we are getting very close to rounding off this session. Uh, let me invite our two uh, experts on the UN uh, and the Security Council to also provide their brief uh, final statements and then we will wrap up. I think we will ask uh, Lydia Swart first uh, to have the final statement and then Professor Schaper. Well, I will respond to David's question. Will we get anything done? Uh, my first instinct is to be rather skeptical because when you followed an issue very closely for for ten years and you see all the, the the complexities both of a procedural and a political nature, you stop being hopeful. Yet there is a new chair uh, who who began uh, just in the last few weeks. He's building a team. He has marching orders from the president of the general assembly to make something happen. And it, it looks so far that he's undaunted. Who knows what he may come up with. So, so it, it will be an interesting year. Thank you. I can imagine that it is fascinating over all these years to kind of see what is going on and what might be happening in the near future.
Okay, let us pass on to Professor Schaper for a final few words. Uh, two remarks then. One of, on this issue David raised, I mean, will we ever get something out of this? I, I first had to work on this issue 20 years ago in the mid-90s. And when I came back to uh, New York in, in 2009, well, uh, in those 15 years at that time, no progress had been made at all. And I can't really say that in the last five years much progress has been made. Uh, so it's easy to be to be cynical. Um, at the same time, I think it, it UN itself raised the issue of UN reform and Security Council reform, and now it's blocked in the UN, which institution which raised which raised the issue itself. So. I think it eats at the credibility of the UN as an effective international organization if we start to, if, if we continue to having a, a, a debate without any results. So I do hope that there will be a certain buildup of pressure that we sh should come to some kind of compromise with which everybody will be unhappy and then it will be a good compromise. And at least we will close the discussion. Um, I know it really, I think I'm a bit too, too, too optimistic and perhaps uh, easy going on this, but I, I think we need to make the point all the time that it eats away at the credibility of the UN if we continue discussing this without having any outcome, even after 20 years. But my second suggestion is to think to pick up the ideas which have been presented in the different papers on criteria for membership of the Security Council. Why not enlarge this to the present? Members of the Security Council. I agree with the remarks made that we can't touch the veto right in a substantial way. But let's turn it around and say, okay, you have the veto right. What do you contribute as permanent member? And I'm, 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 I was thinking about this because there was one the former Foreign Secretary of the UK, Robert Owen, who, who suggested each permanent member of the Security Council should have 10,000 troops available for UN operations. And if he doesn't if that country doesn't contribute, it should lose its position of, of permanent security council member, or it should lose its veto right, or whatever. There should be a criterion even for the P5. And I think that is a perhaps a, a good way to approach the whole issue, that we're not just talking about the, the new members, but also the permanent members who should contribute more, uh, in, and then not just in peacekeeping, but in a general way to, to the UN putting in that way also some pressure on them. What if, for instance, the General Assembly would then have an agreed text and adopt a resolution on the criteria for membership of the Security Council more in detail than Article 23 of the Charter? That would then not only apply to the new members, but also to the present members. And, and we should set the bar higher, I think, in that respect. That was uh, one last suggestion, uh, Chair. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes, will anything ever come out of this? Well, let us hope that the answer will indeed be a yes. We don't know when the yes will happen, but eventually I guess that might be the case. Okay, thank you all very much again for all the very helpful contributions, the written proposals, your participation in this online discussion, our two experts on the UN. Thank you so much for having shared your thoughts with us on these proposals and beyond. Thank you all very, very much for your participation. This concludes our online discussion on the UN Security Council and potential reform. Thank you very much and to some of you I'll say again hello next week when we get back briefly in this course. Goodbye, thanks very much. Goodbye.